Hi everybody. So today we're going to be talking about including a seer council on jet bikes in your Eldar army. Now first of all, what is a seer council? A seer council, even though the word doesn't exist anywhere in the army building section of the Eldar Codex, is just a term that Eldar players use to describe a unit of warlocks led by a farseer. They're extremely points heavy, they're a bit of a Death Star unit, which is why they have kind of a special name to them. And uh, it, they're a very unique type of unit, which is why we kind of give them a, a different name, just so people, uh, so that elder players can understand when we're talking about what we put in on our armies. Now, the Seer Council uh, on jet bikes is uh, is a very, very deadly unit. They can hurt vehicles, they can hurt infantry, they can survive almost anything when fortune is going. Um, they are extremely points heavy. I mean, each one of these guys starts at 45 points. The far seer, of course starts at 85 points, but he's never going to be that cheap, never in a million years going to be that cheap. Um, you know, this whole unit can range anywhere from 400 to 600 points in cost, just for a unit of, uh, of uh, you know, of, of warlocks, you know, five or six warlocks with a farce here, it can be very, very expensive. But they are pretty deadly on the tabletop, so we're going to talk about what they do, what they can't do, and uh, why you might want to consider them in your Eldar army. Okay, let's start off by talking about their stats and abilities. Um, they have Space Marine Toughness, Space Marine Armor Save. Every Warlock has a 4+, plus, including the Farseer, has a 4+, plus Invulnerable Save. I mean, pretty amazing stuff. They have a good initiative. They have good weapon skill. Uh, they have abilities which can up both of those things. They have customizability. You can buy different powers for them. Pretty interesting stuff. Let's go through some of that. Let's take the Farseer away and just talk about some of our... Um, of our buddies that we have here. Now the first thing you can, uh, the first power that they can take is they can take Conceal, which is a permanent 5 plus cover save. On a unit of jet bikes, it's almost completely useless. They already have a 4 plus invulnerable save, plus they gain a 5 plus jinx save just for moving. Pretty interesting stuff, plus which can become a 4 plus cover save if you go flat out, which you don't even need to because you're getting an invulnerable save. Unless you're dealing with something weird like Null Zone or something, you're not, you're not going to need to rely on that cover save very often. So not a, not, a, not a useful power for these guys. More useful powers, though, are the next three. Uh, enhance uh, gives you plus one initiative, plus one weapon skill. Great power, and it gives it to the whole unit. So as long as that one guy with it survives, the whole unit gets it. Another great power, Embolden, allows the unit to reroll uh, all leadership tests, which includes psychic power checks. Very important. If you, for some reason, fail your psychic powers, not very often with Eldar, because you usually have runes of witnessing, but if you fail that check, um, you can reroll it if you have Embolden in the squad. Pretty amazing. And the last one is Destructor, which is essentially a heavy flamer. Heavy flamer for any of these guys that you want. I mean, that's amazing, right? That's just an amazing power. Now, keep in mind, because it's a psychic power, and uh, technically psychic powers are different than shooting weapons in Overwatch, th the common understanding is that you cannot use Destructor on Overwatch, which would be amazing to just have a unit of these guys with the equivalent of a heavy flamer, D3 hits from each one. The common understanding is that you cannot do that because of the wording of, the, uh, the, of Destructor itself. That said, though, very effective upgrade for these guys. Now, keep in mind, all these upgrades, all these things you can buy for them, make them even more expensive. They're already incredibly expensive, so you've got to really pick and choose. Ne next uh, important thing to think about putting on these guys is they all come with a Witchblade, and that Witchblade is uh, Strength 3, but uh, Armor Bane, so 2d6 to penetrate vehicles. Not as good as the previous edition, but uh, in some cases, uh, still pretty useful. Uh, great for killing vehicles, and it wounds always on a 2+, plus. and any toughness in the game, wounded on a 2+, plus, amazing. It doesn't cut through armor, but that would be too good, but it, it does wound you on a 2+. Plus. You can, for 3 points instead, upgrade and get a Singing Spear. Now, the beauty of the Singing Spear is that, uh, unlike the Witchblades, which got a bit of a nerf, although in some situations, if you do the statistical analysis, they're not actually nerfed, but anyways, that's another video. Um, the, the Singing Spear is Strength 9, just like in the old days, because that's what it is in the Codex. Strength 9 against vehicles, you can throw it 12 inches, and it still wounds on 2 plus in combat. The main difference between taking a Singing Spear, you say, well, it's 3 points, why wouldn't I always take that upgrade? Because that halves your number of attacks, because each Warlock has a pistol and his Witchblade. So in combat, you get 2 attacks, 3 if you're charging. If you only have 1 attack from your 2-handed Singing Spear, you're only getting one in combat, two from charging. Very big difference. 
So uh, as I was saying, very big difference in the number of attacks you get when you have a singing spear in close combat versus a witch blade. I mean, given that you wound on two pluses, you want every possible attack in melee. So that's going to change the role of these guys. If you give them singing spears, that's going to change the role of the unit. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Now, how do you get a unit of warlocks in your army? Put pretty simply, they're one of these uh, types of units that when you buy an HQ, it opens up a slot. Now, these guys technically count as H2, HQ, but they don't take up a slot. But you need to buy a Farseer HQ, and that allows you to buy a unit of 3 to 10 Warlocks. And that's how you buy these guys. Now, in terms of other things they have that you need to, you need to remember is, each one of their jet bikes is still an Eldar jet bike. So that means it comes with two, uh, it comes with a twin-linked Shuriken catapult. So two shots... Only 12 inch range, but they are twin linked, and their ballistic skill is better than the Guardian jet bikes. Their ballistic skill is 4. So, twin linked on 4s, you're going to hit very, very often with that strength 4 gun. Very effective. Something to remember when you're, you know, blowing 60 points on, you know, destructors everywhere, and you realize, well, actually, you get a lot of good strength 4 shots, anyways. Um, now, that twin linked nature of those guns is pretty interesting when it comes to flying monstrous creatures, because Really, with flying monstrous creatures, the issue is to shoot them, is to get them to fall down from the sky. So you don't really care about what the strength of the guns is. You just want to get hits on the unit. And twin-linked uh, guns are very good at actually getting a few hits on things that are flying high. Now, you're obviously not going to hurt many flyers with those strength four guns, but uh, for monstrous creatures, it's actually something very important to remember that you do have that. And on Overwatch, of course, twin-linked strength four guns... Hey, not too bad at all. I mean, that, that's going to cause some damage. So remember, these guys are, have a lot of abilities you've got to remember. The last upgrade to mention um, is Spirit Seer. Any of these guys can take it. The only reason you would take that upgrade is if you want to have a mobile uh, you know, fulcrum point for your Wraith Guard or your Wraith Lords, because the 12-inch bubble makes it that it would stop Wraith Sight on them. You know, I, I don't tend to use these guys I in that kind of way. I tend to use them as a very aggressive unit, so I'm, I'm usually flying far away from my Wraith units, but it, it is an option that exists there if you want it. Now, let's talk about their movement capabilities. You know, they are on Eldar jet bikes, and jet bikes move 12 inches in the movement phase. They have an extremely useful ability where in the assault phase, if they don't assault something, they get a free 2d6 move in any direction they want. You pick a direction, you roll 2d6, and you move up to that distance. So this allows them to fly in, gun something down, and then chicken away out of, potentially, out of uh, charge range. Not always, of course, their guns are very short, you know, it's, but it is an option. Or to fly, to fly out of cover, blast something, and fly back into cover. You know, a very useful ability. Mind you, with these guys, they have a 4 plus and vulnerable. It's not going to matter that much. But it also means you can fly up 12 inches, shoot something, and then tw fly up 2d6 more inches to get closer to whatever th the thing you're trying to go after is. These guys are extremely fast. Of course, like all Eldar jet bikes, they can go 12 and then go flat out 36 more inches in, in the... Uh, in the, um, the flat-out phase, amazing speed on these guys. You can reposition them at will. And unlike in the previous edition, where you, if you went flat-out, it meant that you couldn't cast your powers at the start of turn. In this edition, you can. You cast your powers, you go in the movement phase, and then flat-out happens in the shooting phase. So you can still fortune these guys. And let's talk about that right now, because that's something that's very important to understand. Without fortune going, without re-rollable saves, re-rollable 3 plus armor or re-rollable 4 plus and vulnerable save, without that re-roll, warlocks are quite possibly the most worthless thing in the entirety of 40k for their points. They are abysmal. They are literally the worst thing imaginable. You can't even put them in a vehicle to hide them. What are they without fortune? They are 45 and 50 and 55 and 60 point space marines. They have the same save against, you know, a, 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 a bolter as a space marine that costs, you know, much, much fewer points. 50 points average for a space marine. You just fire a bunch of strength forward, watch them die. That is disastrous. That is the worst thing in 40k. However, when, when fortune factors into the equation, when you re-roll that 3 plus from the crappy shooting, you re-roll the 4 plus against really good shooting, these guys become quite amazing and quite survivable. So that's very important to remember. You have to take fortune on this unit. If you do not take fortune on your Jet Bike Seer Council, you are just taking the worst thing in your codex. You are going to get crushed because these guys are so many points, you're going to really struggle. You know, it's just not worth it. It's not worth the risk. 
take Fortune. And for that matter, take Embolden in the squad. First of all, to make sure that you pass, you know, uh, like checks to, for fleeing and for not getting pinned. And second of all, so that you can re-roll your fails over here. If you roll 6, 6, uh, 5 or, or triple sixes on Fortune, man, that's a disaster. You want to make sure you pass that Fortune, get that re-roll happening. Um, take Runes of Witnessing. You know, why would you take runes of witnessing? You're already on a leadership 10. You're already getting a reroll from a bolden. Because you are going to fail it eventually. I've played this game way too long. I've had that happen to me multiple times. I roll triple sixes. I reroll 665. Or whatever happens. Those kind of disasters will happen. And the moment that happens, your game is going into disaster mode. You're, you're probably already losing terribly if these guys get gunned down just by some easy amount of, you know, strength 3 and 4 shooting. You need to make sure that save is happening. Because without that, these guys are disastrously crappy. They are beyond worthless without that reroll. You have to make sure that reroll is happening. That means that in those situations where you're facing uh, those uh, Space Wolf guys that have the, um, you know, f like a 4 plus save against your powers, you've got to stay out of range of that. I mean, that, that's, that's really deadly to you. Um, so make sure Fortune is happening. And uh, get that stuff going. Okay, so how do we field these guys? My most common choice to keep the unit effective but still sensible is either five or maybe six warlocks with a farseer. That's a pretty good size. That means you can actually take some casualties and still maintain your toughness, still be a real threat on the board. Um, it also means that you have enough tax, uh, attacks in melee that when you're facing, you know, like Terminator saves, you can actually force quite a few failed saves. And you've got six warlocks and a farce here going into combat, you probably have enhance going, which means you're going first, you're going to force a lot of saves. You know, that's uh, 21 attacks, assuming that you're using witch blades, not singing spears. 21 attacks, hitting on threes, wounding on twos. That's going to kill some terminators, even though they have a two plus save and you don't go through their armor. So that's, uh, that's a good number. You can still take some casualties and still be really scary. I don't really recommend going a full unit of 10 because it costs so many points that really... Uh, and, it, and it doesn't gain you much more. It makes the unit a little bit too big. It means you can't maneuver around the table as nicely. It means that uh, you know, you're, you're going to have real trouble getting in each other's way. And it also means you've spent so many points that the rest of your army is very, very small. Whatever point cost you're playing, the your rest of your army is severely hampered by the lack of points. Because each one of these, like we said, costs roughly 50 points to add to the unit. That's what I like to do. I like to have, you have to have fortune going on your Farseer. You probably want to have your standard gear, your runes of warding, runes of witnessing. Um, you want to have at least one or even two of these guys with Embolden. Embolden is such a good power that I often put it on two guys because it's so cheap. It's only five points. Because if one guy dies, then maybe the guy back here still has it. Thank goodness we're not fleeing off the table from the first, you know, two casualties that happen. We're not uh, fleeing off the, we're not getting pinned. We're not, uh, you know, uh, having other bad stuff happen that requires leadership. You know, if, God forbid, if you lose combat, you know, by two sometime, maybe something really bad luck happens, you don't want the Seer Council to be cut down from one slightly whiffed combat. You want that reroll. You want that leadership reroll. Enhance, usually I'll put it on one guy in the unit just to give the whole unit um, you know, that increased weapon skill and, and initiative. Um, uh, it's a great power. It's always worth taking. Uh, I, I wouldn't take it more than once. It's, it is pretty expensive. It's 15 points. In Eldar, you're already very tight on points. So it's worth taking it. Destructor, it's up to your choice. You know, six. You know, uh, assuming you've taken Embolden, uh, Enhanced, three guys with Destructor, you know, four guys with Destructor, I mean, man, that is nasty. But keep in mind, you're, you're upping the point cost of each one of these guys by ten more points that you give a Destructor to. And something's got to die first, right? Something has to take casualties. So if, turn, if, you, if you, you know, your first turn, your two guys with Destructor are in the front, they, they get killed, well, you've just lost 20 extra points that you wouldn't have lost otherwise. Maybe take one or two Destructors in the unit, just to give you an option to, to clear away really soft chaff units. I don't know. I don't tend to take Destructor these days too much, but it is a worthwhile thing to take. But I, just don't go overboard, because when you start buying like a million of them in the unit, then you really end up having a, a, a unit that's terribly overpriced. And uh, the other option is to also give... Um, your Farseer, uh, other powers. So another common uh, thing that you see people doing is they take Fortune and they take Mind War because this unit's always jumping around, you know, it's 12-inch move in the, sh in the phase, shooting something, 
Uh, this guy maybe then mind wars somebody, and then you're jumping back. You know, you're doing all kinds of nasty stuff. So mind war is a good option there. Now, if you take the witch blades, you're making them consistently. They're going to be anti-tank and anti-infantry. Against tanks, these guys are going to do pretty well. Even against armor or ten, they still do pretty decently well. Even though it's only strength three with the two d six, and the fact that you hit vehicles much more often than you used to means these guys are going to do some real damage to rear armor ten. Rear armor eleven, twelve, or thirteen. That's starting to get pretty crazy. You know, when these guys fight like one of those Necron walkers that has a rear armor. Uh, or rather, its front armor is 13, and because it's a because it's a walker, you know, you, fights using its its front armor, that gets really that that really shows how how much weaker the witch blades are against vehicles. But against armor 10, they're still pretty good. If you take uh, the spears instead, then um, you've got a unit which can actually deal uh, at range with vehicles pretty darn well. They can whip stuff at vehicles nicely. In which case, I highly recommend taking guide because. Singing spears on a, you know, on a seer council are actually a great way when they're guided of dealing with flyers. You know, again, Eldar does not have a lot of stuff that deals with flyers. I know I've mentioned that in, in previous videos, but we have ways we can sort of tweak to uh, to get some kind of anti-flyer defense. And one of those ways is to have guide a reroll happening on a good high strength weapon. In fact. Singing spears are pretty much the only the strength nine individual weapon in the entire codex. I mean, the only other thing that can come close is a fire prism, which fires a blast. But these guys with five, uh, five singing spears, five strength nine uh, shots, re-rolling to hit against a flyer, are going to get some hits. You're going to get, you know, maybe two hits out of that. Maybe one and a half hits on average. Who knows? But you're going to get some hits, and strength nine against armor 10, 11, or 12 is really good. It's really good. It's going to cause some real damage. It's going to strip hull points, if not, you know, actually cause, um, cause uh, you know, a penetration. So something important uh, that, to think about is if you're really having trouble with flyers and you have a seer council, consider giving them a singing spears and using them as more of a shooty unit rather than a melee unit. Because again, they lose that attack when they take the singing spears. So they're not as good in melee. So why do you take a seer council in your Eldar army? You take them because they are a Death Star unit in the truest sense of the word. They have a lot of points invested, but they are very, very resilient. They can take on any target in the game, considerably. They can, they can be credible against any target in the game, um, uh, assuming you've outfitted them the right way. And uh, they are just a real spoiler unit. They can tie up much nastier things for many, many turns. They can cleave their way through, through uh, things that you know, would take a long time for other things to, to chop through. Um, they are very resilient. They're very fast. They can respond to almost any side of the board. And uh, they, they, they are just kind of a premier, um, they're, they're a linchpin unit for your army. They're the kind of unit that you, they, that you build your army around them because you know that most games are they're probably going to be around for at least a good enough amount of time to cause some trouble. Um, uh, now, there's some ways to field them. We, we, I talked about how I don't like having a full unit of 10. I think that's too much. I think that's uh, too many points invested. If I was going to do that, well, something you may have seen in my battle reports before is I've done two smaller units of five. I don't have all of them uh, on the table here, but for instance, I've done two smaller units where I have two smaller units uh, of them, and one of them will have that are therefore spears, another unit will have witch blades. I like that setup because the spears go against vehicles and flyers, the guys with witch blades charge into whatever they can fight. Now, uh, I've seen some people talking about taking uh, a seer council with two farseers. So we've got my second farseer here, two farseers, one of which has fortune and probably guide. Another one can take divination powers or maybe telepathy. Maybe you'll be lucky enough to get invisibility. Man, I mean, that is pretty awesome. That is a pretty awesome setup. But it's not my favorite uh, setup only for the, the reason that you're using two HQ choices in your one unit. You've already made this a huge target. You've already made this a Death Star unit. This is already going to decide, uh, determine whether you win the game, most games. And you don't want to make, you don't want to sink more uh, risk into it. Not my favorite choice. I'd much rather have this guy in a unit of jet bikes, for instance, or another unit of uh, small Seer Council warlocks and, uh, and, and helping out that way. But it is an option to consider. There are some extremely powerful combos if you roll the right powers that you can do. When you've got Fortune going and you've got this guy doing one of the other, uh, one of the other trees, okay? Pretty, pretty interesting option you can do there. Now, something I want to mention, because I didn't mention this when I was talking about their abilities, but it is beautiful and crucial to know. These guys all have fleet. 
Unlike jet bike guardians, which do not have fleet, check the rules, they do not have fleet, these guys have fleet, they keep their fleet. And if you check the rules for fleet in 6th edition, there is nothing specified about having to be on foot. So fleet works on their jet bikes. And how does a, a charging jet bike work? You, you, uh, you ignore the terrain for purposes of being slowed down. Mind you, it still affects you that you're going to be striking last. We do not have offensive grenades. However, you no longer have to roll three dice and throw away the highest to charge a slow distance. You charge your normal distance, no problem, into terrain in this edition. Um, but you do take a dangerous terrain test. Mind you, as you know, dangerous terrain tests are now not nearly as dangerous as they used to be. You still get your armor save, which with these guys is going to be re-rollable. You know, fart in the wind. You're not going to have to worry about it um, that often. But it means that you are charging, you're ignoring the, the slowdown of terrain when you charge, and you have fleet. So these guys are even faster when you think about it. In terms of getting into assault and tying things up, they are extremely effective at it because of that fleet. Because they are fleeting their way into combats. My goodness, unbelievable. You know, a unit like that with fleet is just golden. So keep that in mind. It's going to help you get into combats. You get your fleet, even though you're on a jet bike. Now, I want to talk about the option that I've, I've seen some people do, and I have done a few times in the past, and that is to add an autark on a jet bike to your seer council on jet bikes. Why would you want to do this? First of all, the autark brings with him the potential of a meltagun. Pretty nice thing to have, especially when you fly in, melt to open a Land Raider, and then fleet charge the guys inside that Land Raider. Pretty awesome potential to do there, especially since you can have the option of some Strength 9 shots to help you crack open vehicles, especially things like Rhinos and stuff that are easier to crack. Pretty interesting option. The second option he brings is he gives you the option of a power weapon in the squad. And that is pretty interesting. It's it's only a Strength 3 power weapon on, an, on a turn that you don't charge. Um... Well, I mean, especially, uh, uh, sorry, what, what am I talking about? Um, if you give him the lance, it becomes a power weapon on the turn you charge, but it's a normal weapon otherwise. His regular power weapon is always just strength three, but it gives you the option in combats where these guys are locked in for a while, and you're fighting something with really good armor saves, or maybe it just has an average armor save, but it also has feel no pain. So really, you can't get those wounds through. You don't cut through any armor. You don't get through feel no pain. It's nice to have something that at least gets through armor saves. That's a pretty interesting option, because this guy has many, many attacks even when he's not charging. Pretty interesting option to do that for that sole reason. Plus, on the charge, it gives this guy a deadly potential power weapon. If you give him the Lance, the Star Lance, I mean, he's, he's usually wounding things on twos, and they're, uh, they're going to be AP3. Pretty, pretty good weapon to have on the charge to really these, give these guys extra punching power. Um, you know, in, in that kind of way. Um, again, not my favorite thing to do because Eldar is such is at such a loss for putting you know psychic powers on the table. You need to put the psychic powers around, so it's hard to put a second HQ that um, is really just kind of sort of upping the power of this unit a little bit, but not really doing anything on his own. That said, it is a pretty nice thing to add, and in a pinch, you can make this guy uh, he can break off from the unit. So let's just say your army has shot down uh, this unit of, Mar you know, there's a unit of Marines on an objective here. There's only three of them left, and there's also a really nasty unit over here somewhere. Maybe there's a, a unit of Terminators that are about to storm onto one of your other objectives. Well, what you can do is separate this guy off and say, I'm going to fly in here, shoot these guys, and then charge with my high-strength armor-cutting weapon. I'm probably going to crush these guys here, unless I really whiff my attacks. In which case, watch out, because it's just a crappy old arm uh, model. But that means he splits off, takes care of this, while these guys split off and go after these guys over here. You know, It gives you some options when there's things you can split off. And he works a lot better for that than, for instance, a second Farseer would be. Because a second Farseer is not that scary in combat. Yeah, he can be, he can be pretty useful in combat, but against you know, really nasty things, he's not that scary. He doesn't have a power weapon. You know? Whereas this guy can do some cleanup duty pretty nicely. So there is that option to do with, a, um, with an Autark. Okay, so in talking about strengths and weaknesses of these guys, I mean, first of all, the strengths, they are really good against uh, middle-of-the-road troops. They are really good against elite troops for the most part because they have invulnerable saves that are re-rollable. Um, they, uh, they wound things that are very tough, uh, you know, on twos anyways. They're great at just, you know, cleaning wounds off of, uh, of monstrous creatures. Um, you know, they're, they're, they can be really good at taking on Armor 11 rear armor on vehicles because the Witchblades are still quite good against rear armor 11. They're not great against higher armor, uh, higher armors in the rear, but they're pretty good at armor 11. 
Um, you know, they can be outfitted to be credible against flyers with their uh, singing spears to actually throw some strength nine spears at things. Uh, with destructors, they can actually clean off weakly armored swarms of, uh, of troops uh, on the ground. Um, and as long as the unit stays with a large number of models, they can fight those kinds of uh, units pretty well in combat because they can force a lot of saves on them, although they're not ideal for them. And uh, they they survive extremely well. They're a real they're a real linchpin of the army. They can just simply tie up things that need to be tied up, even if these guys don't survive. As long as they've really caused trouble for your opponent, let your rest of your army do its business. They can be really really effective. You know what are their weaknesses? First of all, their point costs. They are extremely points heavy. Um, you know they're going to eat up a huge chunk of your points. Even just an, a middle of the road type of uh, sized unit is going to eat up a lot of your points. Um, Ultimately, they do suffer from uh, from bad luck. I mean, you're protected against average bad luck with those rerolls. But on turns, you know, I've had turns where five wounds come into the unit. I fail four of them. I reroll. I still fail all four, and four of these guys are just dead instantly. I mean, when that happens, that that doubles how bad uh, your luck is because this unit needs to survive long enough to actually be a threat, to actually have shots coming at them, to have you know wounds being put on them so that they can shrug off. Because, uh, so, you know, when you get hit with really bad luck with these guys, it's going to be disastrous. I'm just telling you right now. You've got to be ready for that. There are going to be some games where they just really terribly roll badly, and you have to be ready for that. And that always gets magnified when you take a unit that's so expensive and has got Death Star like these guys. Um, they're also not great against things with 2 plus armor. They're really not great against them. Now, I mean, we talked about how you could put lots of wounds and you could still have these guys fail, but, you know, let's assume you're, you're facing, uh, you know, Terminators with Feel No Pain. I mean, man, that's a disaster. You're, you're going to be stuck there forever, and, you, and hopefully being stuck there forever with these guys is useful to you because it'll maybe keep something much nastier away from the rest of your army. But don't expect to kill uh, Terminators that have Feel No Pain particularly effectively with the Seer Council. Unless you have some kind of maybe power weapon in there, and maybe you have maybe have doom on the unit to make a strength three actually hurt them, they're not great against things with armor two. Although they can still deal with them because of the volume of attacks they put out, they're not great against uh, dreadnoughts because now they have to go against that front armor twelve and strength three rolling two dice uh, to penetrate. It's still not going to be very great. You know, you are going to hurt it, but it's it's not going to be that great. You know, mind you, of course, the dreadnought's not going to hurt too many of your guys either. So that's not going to be a problem, but uh, it, you know they're they're not going to be as effective against things like that. And uh, their one biggest weakness, the one you always have to remember, is if fortune fails, if fortune does not succeed, if it's not put on this unit, they are the most worthless thing in your codex. Without fortune, these guys are worse than useless because you've eaten up so many points buying them. And there are going to be some situations where that happens. I'm not going to tell you that the first time that you don't get fortune on them, they're, they're going to die, because maybe, depending on the situation on the board, maybe you can retreat them before anything happens. You know, If fortune fails, though, uh, if for whatever reason, retreat these guys. Send them as far away from enemy shooting as possible. Hide them behind whatever you can. You, you know, It's not worth flying forward if you don't have the fortune. It, they're, they're simply the worst thing if they don't have fortune on them. You've got to get that fortune on them. You've got to keep it on every turn. Pray for the best. But if that stays on, they're going to be very, very resilient. Okay, everybody, I hope that was useful to you to understand a little bit more about these guys. Uh, you know, the video is already going pretty long, and I could really talk about these guys forever. So if there's anything I forgot to mention or there's any more uh, questions you have about them, please either post uh, uh, in the comments section or uh, just send me a private message, and uh, I'll be very happy to answer any questions for you guys about them, this or other videos, okay? Alright guys, take care and keep playing Eldar and keep watching.